about 400 years ago, a movement started that is called modern science. It was started by a clergyman called Copernicus and helped by Galileo, Newton, Kepler, Descartes, all great luminaries of this modern science. This modern science gave us much of what we enjoy today as technology. It also gave us a huge number of prejudices. That is the flip side of this new science. Quantum physics has been around for more than 100 years in one form or other, although the mathematics, the formal, what we call quantum physics, was discovered in 1925-26 by two great scientists, Werner Heisenberg and Erwin Schrodinger. Now, uh, the ideas have been around since 1900, when Max Planck used the word quantum for the first time. The word has a Latin origin. It means quantity. But the way uh, Planck used it was very specific. Planck used it to denote a discrete quantity of energy, a bundle of energy. Now, this is already a break from one of the huge prejudices of Newtonian physics. That prejudice is called continuity. Continuity of all quantities in physics, specifically continuity of energy. Planck says energy is not continuous. At the base level, energy comes in bundles. That he called a quantum. Five years later, Einstein proposed, and it was verified, that indeed light comes in such bundle of energy, although paradoxically, light also behaves like waves in some experiments. So it became clear after Einstein worked that not only uh, prejudices open up in terms of being challenged, like continuity, but there are also paradoxes arise from quantum physics. In Newtonian physics, there is therefore no such thing as um, some object being particles in some experiments and some objects, same object being waves in some other experiments. This just doesn't happen in Newtonian physics. Waves are waves, particles are particles forever. But in quantum physics, it seems like topsy-turvy. Same object, light, can both be particles and waves. And a few years later, Louis de Broglie in 1923, um, he suggested, theorized, that maybe matter itself, all matter, is like that, like light. Wave and particle, both. And that too was verified in 1926. So no question that uh, paradoxes arise in the uh, new physics. Niels Bohr made a huge contribution by clarifying the amount of discreteness there is in the quantum world. He proposed a theory of the atom, which electrons not only move in continuous ways in orbits around the atomic nucleus, but when an electron jumps from one orbit to another, it actually does not go through, according to Bohr, does not go through the intervening space. Nobody has ever seen any jump like this or conceived any jump like this in Newtonian physics. Electrons going from one orbit to another without going through the intervening space. Where does the electron go in between? So this question began to haunt us. Real discontinuity, quantum leap, as Bohr called it, and then finally, in 1925-26, as I mentioned already, Heisenberg and Schrodinger in quick succession discovered the equations of the new physics, and quantum physics formally began. Quantum physics uh, suggested principles, and those principles are verified that squarely challenged many of the prejudices of classical physics. So one by one, we'll talk about uh, first some of the prejudices that were challenged, and then we'll talk about some of the paradoxes that arose, uh, one by one. Prejudices, continuity, 
this is a uh, fundamental prejudice of Newtonian physics. It was challenged, as I already have said, by Max Planck with his concept of the quantum, and then specifically by Niels Bohr with the idea of quantum beam. And it hasn't quit quantum physics yet. Discontinuity is a part and parcel of quantum physics. A second great challenge came uh, to the principle of locality. In Newtonian physics, it is assumed that all signals propagate through space and time. And for any interaction, you need a signal connecting the two objects that are interacting. Communication, interaction require signals. In quantum physics, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, three great physicists in 1935, wrote a paper that startled the entire world of physics. In fact, one of the authors Einstein had great problems with, accepting his own calculation. And the idea was that if two objects interact, they become correlated in such a way that even when they move away from each other and not interacting, even then they would be able to communicate instantly without exchanging any signal. There is no local signal required. This is called quantum non-locality. So if this is verified, that means that locality, that very coveted prejudice of Newtonian physics has to be given up as well. And more, you ask the question, where is non-locality located? Where, where is this connection? This connection that does not require any signal, where is that located? Because according to the theory of relativity that Einstein coveted, and this is why Einstein had such a hard time believing non-locality, according to Einstein's theory of relativity, any space-time connection has that limit, speed of light. You cannot have a communication faster than the speed of light if you confine yourself to space and time. So where is this connection taking place, signal-less communication? We have to say that it's taking place outside of space and time. This concept of outside of space and time is introduced immediately as you accept the idea of non-locality. So it's not really Reality is not really just one reality, space and time and matter moving in space and time. This idea that even today, most scientists, most scientists even today believe in, this is a prejudice that continues. In fact, not only continues among scientists, the newspapers, media just buy this concept lock, stock, and barrel. If you suggest that something there is outside of space and time, it's called super nature. nature to media and to most scientists mean only one thing, matter moving in space and time. Quantum physics is squarely contradicting this with the idea of non-locality. And guess what? In 1982, three physicists in France, led by Alain Aspect, verified that indeed there is non-locality. There is non-locality, experimental. It's not just theoretical fancy. So in this way, the idea of discontinuity and non-locality were introduced in quantum physics pretty early on. Their experimental verification, of course, had to wait. As I said, discontinuity was immediate, but the verification of non-locality had to wait until 1982. Perhaps that uh, played a huge role in how the history has turned out, why Newtonian prejudices are so adamantly held even today. That huge time gap that occurred between 1935 and 1982 has not been very healthy for science. Let me go back to the paradoxes that occur. I've already mentioned wave-particle paradox, how can the same object be wave and particle both? When the equation of quantum physics was discovered, uh, it became clear that the waves that we are talking about are waves of possibility. 
they are not really regular waves as we see moving in space and time. They are waves, all right. They have the prop character of propagation. They have character, other characters of waves, but they are waves of possibility residing outside of space and time. Again, that concept, that non-locality confirmed. Outside of space and time, Heisenberg called this potentia. So there are waves residing in potentia outside of space and time. Waves of possibility. And then when you observe these waves, of course, we find objects that we call particles. So somehow the waves collapse into particles. And this is the meaning of the duality. Duality means that they are both simultaneously waves, but waves reside in potentia outside of space and time. When you observe, the waves convert into particles, collapse into particles. But we are left with a two-world dichotomy. The, there is a world beyond space and time where possibilities reside, and then when we observe, that world gives us the manifest world. The world of actuality is produced. This two-level reality. But it's not dualism, because the world of possibility is becoming the world of actuality. They are, how they have to be posited, have to be conceptualized. Niels Bohr again rose to the occasion, suggested that the word complementarity be used. This idea of complementarity reminds of many people of very ancient tradition. For example, in Chinese medicine, in Chinese philosophy, in Taoist philosophy, there is the concept that the whole is Tao, totality, wholeness, but it always comes to us in the form of yin and yang. Yang is the transcendent that becomes in the immanent. This is called complementarity. Reality comes to us with the help of complementary objects, wave and particle, transcendent and immanent. That is also another spiritual language, and yin and yin and yang. That's the Chinese Taoist language. So a uh, uh, hope grew already. This is 1920s and 1930s. That maybe quantum physics has something to say about integration of very ancient traditions, spiritual traditions, mystical traditions, with the tradition of physics, tradition of science. This too was a first. But this is just barest of hint. This paradox of, of, of um, there is a paradox here that still uh, remains to be discussed, not just the wave particle paradox, because waves, when observed, gives us uh, particles. And crucial point here is observed. So there are two things here. What is making the waves into the particles? And how is our observation doing it? And does our observation make the crucial change? crucial point gives the cause. These are questions that was that arose. This question became very serious question when one realizes, as von Neumann did, the great mathematician John von Neumann, that if you have submicroscopic objects like electron, proton, neutrons, as possibility waves. And you make macro matter out of these possibility waves. Then the macro matter should also be, in principle, waves of possibility. Although approximately, they may behave like Newtonian objects. How they behave like Newtonian objects was part of quantum mathematics. People understood those things very clearly. But nevertheless, the question can be asked that how does observation, how does this collapse happen at all? Because what we observe with, be it a Geiger counter for electrons, ultimately the human observer, either way, what we are observing with is also according to the Newtonian principles of physics that now we call scientific materialism, consists of matter, material objects only. 
And here is then the catch. If all material objects, micro and macro, are waves of possibility, then any measurement ultimately is just possibility looking at possibility, possibility interacting with possibility. How can that ever give you actual events of experience? How can that collapse the possibility objects into actual objects? How can that collapse that potentia, what was possibility, into what is actual in manifestation? And what is the point of an observer? In fact, uh, observer, as I said, like the Geiger counter, if you believe completely in scientific materialism, then observer just itself, himself, herself, made up of possibility waves, and it is a possibility wave, and therefore possibility coupled to possibility. It cannot do anything but produce bigger and bigger possibilities. So where is this collapse? The paradox thickened when von Neumann proved a mathematical theorem that material interactions can never change waves of possibility into actuality. Material interactions can change only possibility waves into other possibility waves. This then became a big, big, big paradox called the quantum measurement paradox. Some people call it observer effect because it is a fact that in the presence of observer, collapse happens anyway. Nobody has observed anything that can be called possibility. We always see only actuality, a concrete event in consciousness. Observer effect, quantum measurement paradox. These are paramount paradoxes of quantum physics. How do you reconcile these paradoxes? Because paradox suggests only one thing. Paradox suggests that there is something grossly illogical about the current way of thinking about science, thinking about space and time, thinking about matter, thinking about the constituents of reality. Something fundamentally wrong. So on one hand, quantum physics is breaking down the paradoxes of the principles that classical physics, Newtonian physics is suggesting. On the other hand, quantum physics is also pointing out grave logical paradoxes that are very difficult to reconcile also with Newtonian physics. And this has been going on for almost 100 years, as I said. We have to really understand why the worldview has not changed in such a long time. I could go into other details. For example, pretty early on, the way Heisenberg discovered his equation suggested to him another very important principle, which is called uncertainty principle. This principle says that you can never determine the trajectory of an object. If you cannot determine the trajectory of an object accurately, you can only calculate approximate trajectories. That means one and only one thing. You can never have a completely deterministic world, as Newton suggested. The whole point of classical physics, the reason that classical physics has been such a, in many ways, such a, um, challenge to people who think in terms of free will is this principle of determinism that Newtonian physics suggested so strongly. This is why the Romantic poets were so much against Newton. This is why William Blake wrote that famous line, single vision and Newton's sleep. Quantum physics says we are not stuck with Newton's sleep anymore. Time to wake up Time to wake up from that, from that sleep where we thought everything is deterministic. It's not deterministic. We do, we might have, we might very well have free will. We might very well have freedom. Freedom can be talked about once again. Tremendous. And as I have said, von Neumann theorem already challenges the dogma of materialism that everything is matter, because if everything is matter, everything would always be only possibilities. Possibilities could never become actual events. So in this way, all the very fundamental principles of Newtonian physics has been challenged. 
then the question is only what does it all this imply? What does all this mean? Is there any way of getting out of the paradoxes in any, any consistent way of getting out of the paradoxes? This is what we have been struggling with and for the last two decades solutions have been proposed, suggestions are there. People still struggle, of course. There are three kinds of struggle here. One kind of struggle is to hold on to older beliefs, older than even Newtonian physics. This is called dualism. People who could never reconcile the Newtonian principle of determinism, they hold on to the old idea that there is also God, there is God's will, and that God's will compete with the determinism of material objects. So that view, dualism, there is a dual world of God and then, then the world of matter. World of matter belongs to science, but the world of God belongs to theology. This is the compromise that we had used for almost 400 years until very recently in the 1950s, materialists gained grounds and more and more of the scientists at least got converted into scientific materialism. Dualism and scientific materialism both are prejudices, both are dogmas. Dualism is a dogma, why? Because scientists point out that if there is a God outside of matter, if there is a non-material God, then this God could not interact with matter because anything that interacts with matter requires to exchange a signal. Signals have energy. But energy of the material world itself is always a constant. Energy never goes out from the material world into some other world that we can call God world or heaven. It just doesn't do that. So if you think dualistically, you have to defy science. You cannot do it within science. But scientific materialism, that the idea that everything is matter, also squarely contradicts the principles of quantum physics itself, which we discovered, which is the physics of today. Quantum physics is, has been verified to such an extent that there is no way that we can ever imagine that there will be some other physics which will restore determinism, restore Newtonian physics, restore locality, restore continuity, any of these things. So what do we do with two dogmas which need to be integrated badly? Because both dogmas are obviously incomplete. Dualism doesn't work, although quantum physics strongly is saying that yes, there are two worlds, but they're not dualistic. They're not dual worlds. Quantum physics is saying that though, there are two worlds. If we compare with our own experience, it's very easy to see that there are two worlds. Everybody goes to sleep, but we wake up again. Isn't that like a dual world? Where do we go when we are asleep? Psychologists have a name for this world. They, they call the world unconscious. We go to the unconscious, we become unconscious. But are we still on in the unconscious? Of course we are on, otherwise how do we make a comeback? We wake up again. So this unconscious conscious, in spiritual traditions the concept is transcendent immanent. I already have mentioned that. This continues, but it is obvious that they are not a dualism because dualism would not be scientific. Quantum physics is saying explicitly that no, it's not dualism. Why? Because of this concept of non-locality. Non-locality connects it. The two, how do the two objects interact? They interact through no energy exchange. They interact by the very interconnectivity of the non-local world. That non-local world is one and only one. Obviously, our ability to know has something to do with all this. Our ability to know has something to do with all this. Because as Heisenberg said, the change of possibility into actuality is ultimately a change in the knowledge of the observer of what is taking place. What does that mean? What is knowledge? What, how do we gain knowledge? Well, we have one facility and only one facility which enables us knowledge. 
and that facility we call consciousness. Consciousness came from the Latin word scure and come, which is with. Scure is to know. So consciousness, a facility that we have with which we know with, to know with. And it is consciousness that must be fundamentally connected. That's interconnectivity that we automatically get to think in terms of quantum physics is nothing but our consciousness. In this way, consciousness enters physics, and consciousness becomes the big, big, big new word, new concept, well, new old concept. That becomes the basis of solving all the paradoxes, understanding all the anomalous data, understanding the new principles of discontinuity and non-locality. In other words, understanding a new world for which you knew a worldview. And it turns out this also is the concept which integrates these two dogmas. Is the world material? Yes and no. Is the world two worlds? Yes and no. Yes, because yes, there is an appearance of that. But no, because it is more subtle than that. So we now have such an integrative science based on the primacy of consciousness. We have a solution to this dichotomy. And this course is about how these solutions arise. Is there any alternative solutions? This is the kind of thing that we'll discuss in the next four lectures.